The Sky Story Observatory has been finished since early November. However, the onset of winter has been, shall we say, tumultuous here in Maritime Canada, and we've only had two good nights since the observatory was completed, while the days themselves were either rainy or pouring wet snow. So it is not till now, the end of the first week of December, that I can finally show you the completed observatory. Living out in the backwoods is great for astrophotography, and we get some great dark skies. That comes with some great advantages, like being able to image targets almost as soon as they come over the horizon without having to worry about light pollution. And I had determined some time ago to build an observatory to take full advantage of that, beginning with the pier. The entire pier went up in a day, and I let it cure for a week, and then built the deck around the pier that would ultimately become the foundation and floor for this basic structure that would become the building around the observatory. When the main structure was done, a split roof was built over it, using simple sliding tracks, landing braces, and restraints to keep the roof in place. And now finally, I can show you the completed structure. It's so simple, I think you might laugh, but it is effective, and it does its job very well. To avoid the risk of ice frozen hinges and make room for the sliding roof, I decided to go with a simple porthole design similar to what is used on sailboats to provide entry into the observatory. And rather than worry about complex ramping for an attached cap over the middle, I decided to go with a simple removable cap. Nova Scotia is practically an island and often we get gale force winds. They had struck just last night, so before taking the roof off, I have to go inside and remove the storm locks which hold the roof down in high winds. Oh, and as you can see there, the high winds are still going on. The weather today when I film this, we'll say, is robust, but it is supposed to be a beautiful night, which is why I decided to go ahead and film the completed observatory today and prepare it for the evening. I like to fire up the equipment a couple hours before dark, get the lens heaters going well in advance while the caps are still on the lenses, and that way not waste a moment of precious clear night. Once the storm clamps are off, it's time to get the sliding roof off. Because this split roof design has an entirely removable cap, it does not matter which side comes off first. Each side of the roof weighs about 40 pounds. I could have built it to about half that weight, but I wanted to build it for snow load. I am contemplating building a lighter roof for summer months and maintaining this heavier version for the winter months. It's a simple matter to get the roof off, and it's designed to resist freezing up in winter. A little push up of a couple inches gives me some purchase to grab it, and then I slide it back and out. The roof is built to overhang the observatory by a couple inches on each side, and when moving the roof, the movement is guided by a couple wooden rails. I thought long and hard about going with a simple roll-off roof, but I also knew with the deep wet snow of maritime winters, I would have constantly been battling to keep those rails clean. Yet. Who knows, I might try a roll-off roof on this observatory next summer. At the left and right corners, where each half of the split roof contacts the main body of the observatory, you'll notice dark straps. Those are industrial-grade cargo straps. If I recall, each one is rated to around 1,200 pounds. They secure the split roof halves against tipping over, and serve as shock absorbers to protect the roof halves from ever falling down. And with the observatory opened up and the entire telescopic system booted up, I'm going to go ahead and get the mount out of park and set up the telescope for observation later this evening. The sky has already improved even in just the time I've been out here. And the telescope was aligned weeks ago. It's pretty much ready to go now. And I won't have to come out into the dark to control it. I'll be able to control it from the warmth of my lab, almost 100 meters away in the cottage. Let's take a look inside and talk about how it all works. When not in use, the telescope sits in a horizontal park. This allowed me to keep the observatory at a lower profile, making it more resistant to Nova Scotia's frequent battering storm winds. The inside of the observatory provides a cozy little operating area. I keep a telegizmo cover in the observatory in case of extreme storms. One additional level of protection on the extremely off chance that roof cap might blow off. However, that roof cap has already ridden through a hurricane force storm and two near hurricane force scales, and it hasn't budged, so I don't think I need it. Still, doesn't hurt to have the extra layer of protection. On the right, you'll see an OD green ammo box. It's been converted to securely hold the surge protector and all the power adapters for the electronics within the observatory. And when the observatory is open, it provides shelter from dew and possible precipitation. The thing that looks like a white can on top is an internet expander. 
It has options to operate at either 5 GHz or 2.4 GHz. Since I live in a remote area where there is no possibility of Wi-Fi interference, I operate the expanders at 2.4 GHz, which increases their range more than five times. This expander all by itself is capable of transmitting to my lab almost 100 meters away. Though to ensure the signal is strong and clear, I keep another Wi-Fi expander halfway between the lab and observatory to serve as a booster. And from the observatory, I can connect to and control the telescope's mount with any desk, rust desk, or Windows remote desktop. Near the top of the pier is a B-Link U59 mini PC. It is preloaded with Stellarium running in MESA mode for a planetarium, which provides data on the location of astronomical targets, all the appropriate ASTAP drivers, and NINA and PHD2 to control the system, as well as SharpCap for when I went to do lucky imaging. I hope Nina gets on the ball with lucky imaging and live stacking applications, but right now, as much as I love Nina, SharpCap is the king at that. But notice the small squarish object at the lower right of the mini PC. It is Velcroed on. That's a GL AR300 M16 pocket modem. It allows me to connect directly to the mini PC without the internet. Thanks to the expanders, the internet reaches the observatory just fine. But should there be an internet failure or a remote desktop failure, I can still connect to the mini PC through that pocket modem. It's fundamentally a backup way to connect to the mini PC. And if I need to be out at the observatory to do something, such as touch up the three-point alignment or reset my park position, things I have to do visually and by hand, the pocket modem allows me to connect to the mini PC and do that without having to set up the expanders. It provides a third function as well. Should I want to travel somewhere, perhaps to a star party, the pocket modem will allow me to wirelessly control my mini PC, along with the mount and telescope and everything else, without needing the internet or a directly wired connection. This means I can control the entire system simply through my laptop. I think I paid about 38 Canadian for it, and I have to tell you, it's a lifesaver. As devices for astrophotography go, it's priceless. The observatory sits on an eight foot by eight foot deck, while the structure itself is five feet four inches by five feet four inches. That makes for a compact workspace, but it's also a very calculated workspace. The observatory is just big enough to handle even a fairly large telescope, and though it can be a tight squeeze, it leaves me adequate room to get around the telescope and work on anything that I might need to. However, the observatory was built with being able to access it from outside the walls in mind, and a simple but sturdy stepladder that I built out of scraps allows that to be done easily. When powering up the observatory, I can reach in through the porthole in the observatory, turn on the surge protector and power up all the systems without ever having to actually go inside. And accessing the pier by way of the step stool on the outside, I can easily touch up the three points alignment, remove the lens caps or do almost anything else to the telescope or mount that I might have to. In fact, I really only have to go inside if I'm going to apply the weather clamps to pin the roof down. And I only have to do that if we're anticipating severe winds. The roof is heavy enough to keep itself in place quite fine otherwise. I'm also very happy with how it's performed in inclement weather so far. I came in here in the thick of that hurricane a couple months back, and it was like a different world in here. I double reinforced all the framing and then double walled the observatory. I know it seems like overbuilding, but we live at one of the highest points in Nova Scotia, and Nova Scotia itself is practically an island, sticking a good ways out into the North Atlantic, and gale force winds are pretty common here winter and summer. So this observatory was built from the ground up with strength in mind. On top of that, the walls were packed with foam and IR insulation and a permeable moisture barrier. And when I came in here during that hurricane, and bear in mind I've also been in here during a couple pretty severe storms, it was, it was just like a different world in here. I could hardly hear the storm. It was bone dry inside, and the structure itself, well, it was stable as a rock. The pier itself is floating. At no place does it directly touch the observatory. Thus, the observatory is able to serve as a windshield for the pier, and it's built tall enough to protect almost the entire telescope structure. So the night winds that are common in Nova Scotia should have little effect on whatever telescope I have mounted. And so far, that has proven to be the case. The biggest thing I had wondered about was whether or not I should put wheels on the split roof. Some persons on some forums that I frequent were adamant that I should, 
At the same time, wheels create places where there can be drafts. It creates weaknesses against wind. It creates places where joins can be frozen. In the end, I figured, go ahead and build without wheels. If I want wheels, I can add them later. And so far, I'm happy with that decision. While I'll admit it would be a little easier to slide the roof off if I had wheels on, it would also create problems that might mitigate that benefit to a good degree. And this roof is light enough. I don't really have to worry about it. So it's a simple design. It's a design anybody can build. And unless you happen to live in a place that's very prone to hurricane and gale force winds, you wouldn't have to overbuild it so much. And the big advantage is the scope is always out here and in 10, 15 minutes, I can have everything fired up and ready to go. And that factors in the time that it takes me to run nearly 100 meters of extension cords out to the observatory, get the porthole and roof open and the lens heaters on, and boot up the Wi-Fi expanders, mini PC, and primary PC. It sounds like a lot of steps, but it's about 90% easier than setting up a tripod whenever I want to use the telescope. I guess I should add, in case you're wondering what that white stuff is on the roof that looks like just white paint, it's actually liquid rubber, and the stuff is, well, I read a lot of the consumer reports about it, everybody seems to be pretty happy with the stuff. And it's apparently extremely durable. It's used to make floors on outdoor decks, as well as roofs on RVs and things. We were able to put multiple coats, I think four, with a single one gallon can, with enough left over to do several more coats again in a few years should we need to. That can cost about 80 Canadian, so in my opinion it was worth it. And it's a lot lighter than going with any standard roofing I could think of, with the exception of steel roofing, and I have some leftover steel roofing from a roof job I did on my cottage last year, after Hurricane Fiona tore the old traditional roof off our house. And steel roofing would have been lighter than a layer of plywood and liquid rubber, but steel roofing, no matter how carefully you work with it, is going to end up with some sharp edges. Even if you make efforts to dull it, they're still going to be somewhat sharp. I worked with enough steel to know how that goes. And that means torn clothes and cuts over time. So I decided to try this first. If I don't like it, I can always switch to a steel roof later. The one thing I'm not fully decided on is I might yet try a roll-off roof next summer. I have some, shall we say, novel ideas for a flexible wooden track design that would not require wooden tracks to be perfectly straight, which is important when you live in a place where changing temperatures and humidity are going to inevitably lead to twists and curves in wood. But we'll see how that goes. I'm going to experiment with this design through the winter and spring, and if I continue to like it by then, I'll keep it. If I see problems, either in repeated needs for maintenance, or I just find this design too much of a chore to work with, I'll switch to a roll-off roof design. For now, the observatory does its job. It shelters the telescope so that when we get clear nights, I can have the whole system up and working in 90% less time. And in the end, that's what an observatory is all about.